Christianity should be viewed as a blood cult. From Old Testament blood rituals to worship of Jesus' blood in the New Testament, explore these unsettling examples from the Bible of the deviance of Christianity. Christians, you're in a blood cult that fetishizes death and you worship an evil God monster. And I've got the evidence to prove it right here in your own book. I've said it before and I certainly wasn't the first, but Christianity is a blood cult. The problem is that its hateful nature has been cleaned and filtered by the priests and pastors and Sunday school teachers and religious parents throughout its history to make it seem like some kind of message of peace and forgiveness and love, when in reality, their God is a bloodthirsty monster in shepherd's clothing. From animal sacrifices in the Old Testament to the worship of Jesus' blood in the New Testament, blood is at the very heart of Christian theology. Christianity is clearly a blood cult, and how blood rituals and sacrifices have shaped the core beliefs of this archaic religion. What are your thoughts on circumcision? It's like pinky swearing, but with your dick. In Genesis 17, 10 through 14, God establishes circumcision as a sign of the covenant with Abraham. Dinky swearing, if you will. This is not just a symbolic act though. It involves literal bloodshed as part of the agreement between Abraham, his God, and his people. As a grown man, you'd have to cut off the end of your penis to join their desert book club. And I suppose when they meet, instead of a secret handshake, they just show each other their dicks? I don't know how that works. Anyway, of course, circumcision has been practiced for thousands of years in Judaism and later influenced Christian traditions as well. It's yet another example of how blood was used to mark devotion to God, another ritualistic act that's common in many ancient cults. In the case of circumcision, though, God commands visiting this bloody ritual specifically on innocent children at the age of eight days old. And of course, as mentioned, any adult wishing to join their faith. Did you know the Old Testament blood rituals didn't stop at the end of your dick? Hmm. Surprise, surprise. In Genesis 15, 9 through 10, God commands Abraham to cut animals in half, and then God, represented by a blazing torch, walks between the bloody carcasses, probably relishing in the smell of their burning flesh. This is how covenants were made, through bloodshed. It wasn't enough to simply make a promise. God doesn't do pinky swears, remember? Blood has to be spilled to seal the deal between Abraham and God. Is that a blood cult I smell? This is a vivid reminder that blood rituals were a core part of the Abrahamic religion long before the concept of Jesus' sacrifice ever even entered the picture. Did you know Moses sprinkled blood on his followers? So Moses, you know, the guy who freed the Israelites from Egypt and parted the Red Sea? Yeah, yeah, that Moses. In Exodus 24, 6-8, he gathers the blood of the sacrificed animals and literally sprinkles it on the Israelites as they writhe and chant to their Lord. Blood to seal their covenant. The blood was seen as sacred, symbolizing the bond between God and his people. Imagine attending a religious ceremony today where the leader unalives bulls right there in front of his followers and then throws blood on the congregation as they chant to God. This is one of the oldest and most graphic examples of the blood obsession that would continue throughout the Bible. The fact that this blood ritual was considered a divine command shows how important blood was in the relationship between God and his followers. Have you heard about the massacre of the Amalekites? The Old Testament is filled with bloodshed, often at the command of God. But I'm going to limit our examples here so I can squeeze in some New Testament examples as well in a minute. With the massacre of the Amalekites in 1 Samuel 15, 3, God commands Saul to kill every man, woman, child, and infant of the Amalekites. Can you imagine the horrific scene? Blood everywhere. Blood cult. This kind of divine command for total annihilation raises serious questions about the morality of the God worshipped in Christianity. But when seen as the actions of an evil God of death, this kind of mass slaughter kind of fits perfectly. It's another example of divine bloodlust justified as obedience to God's will, with zero love or mercy to be found. Hmm. Now, let's move on to some more Christian-specific examples. Think you're not in a blood cult? Hmm. Let's start with the obvious. You do know that Jesus died to shed his blood for humanity, right? Blood cult. One of the most well-known aspects of Christianity is that Jesus' death was a blood sacrifice. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This belief forms the foundation of Christian theology. The idea is that Jesus had to shed his blood to atone for the sins of humanity, thereby releasing man from the need to sacrifice animals to rid themselves of their sins. But why would an all-powerful God of mercy, forgiveness, and love require a blood sacrifice for forgiveness in the first place? 
It's a question that again challenges the logic behind Christian mercy and makes the sacrifice of Jesus feel more like a ritual slaughter, placing the religion in line with an ancient cult that requires blood to appease their gods. Hmm. Continuing on with that theme, why is Jesus called the Lamb of God? In Christianity, Jesus is often referred to as the Lamb of God, symbolizing a sacrificial animal. In John 1, 29, John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In ancient times, lambs were commonly sacrificed in rituals. By calling Jesus the Lamb of God, Christians view Jesus as the ultimate blood sacrifice. The symbolism here is unmistakable. Jesus' purpose was to be slaughtered for humanity's sins, much like how ancient cultures offered animals to appease their bloodthirsty gods. Hmm. Blood cult. Did you know the blood of Jesus is essential for salvation? In John 6, 53-56, Jesus says, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. This is the foundation of Christian communion, where believers symbolically consume the blood and body of Christ. Blood cult. Blood cult, right? I mean, blood cult. Think about it. Eternal life is tied to drinking blood. Are, wait. Are Christians vampires? Hmm. Maybe. But this direct reference to drinking blood makes Christianity's relationship with blood feel more and more like an ancient death cult than a modern ethical religion. What about the communion cup of Jesus' blood at the Last Supper? Keeping with the theme of drinking Jesus' blood, in Matthew 26, 27 through 28, during the Last Supper, Jesus shares a cup of wine with his disciples, telling them it represents his blood. This ritual, repeated in churches all over the world, involves drinking the symbolic blood of Jesus. Think about it. Christians gather regularly to drink blood in a ritual that commemorates a violent death. Blood cult worshiping a god of death. Another striking example of this can be found in Revelations 1, 5 through 6. This verse describes how Jesus has freed us from our sins by his blood. This isn't about Jesus dying, it's specifically about the power of his blood. In Christian hymns and prayers, believers worship the blood of Jesus, glorifying it as the ultimate source of salvation as proven by number one on our top 10 list of examples proving Christianity is a blood cult. Christians literally sing about the cleansing nature of the blood of Jesus. Modern Christianity clearly still celebrates the symbolism of blood, even in its hymns. Take for example the popular hymn, wait, 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 you know the words. I'll start and you finish. Okay, here we go. Washed in the, come on, you can do it washed in the okay I'll, I'll even hum the rest washed in the hmm, 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 hmm. you got it washed in the blood of jesus the song's lyrics focus on the idea that believers are cleansed by the blood of christ are you washed in the blood it's hard to overlook the disturbing imagery here being washed in blood is not something you would expect from a peaceful loving religion it sounds more like something you'd expect from an evil god monster of abraham and its book of death to be honest, it really sounds more like something you'd see in a Stephen King movie or a 1980s horror flick about devil worshippers. But in Christianity, being washed in blood is something to be celebrated, reinforcing the central role blood plays in their faith and further backing up my claim that it's a blood cult. Now, they claim being washed in blood is symbolic, but the examples in the Old Testament clearly show the original intent was literal, not symbolic. If you're a Christian, you are in a blood cult and you worship a god of death. These 10 examples, and I could come up with so many more, show a clear pattern in both the Old Testament and New Testament. Christianity has a deep fixation on blood. Whether it's the blood of animals, the blood of Jesus, the merciful slaughter of innocents, or blood rituals practiced by the early followers, this obsession with blood easily places Christianity alongside other ancient blood cults. And if you didn't realize you were in a blood cult or that you worshiped an evil god monster, but the cracks in your faith are starting to widen, I encourage you to look deeper into the origins of these rituals and ask yourself, why is blood so important to this religion? And when does the actual mercy and forgiveness start to kick in? Does this sound like a god of love to you? In the early chapters of Genesis, God creates man and woman, then allows the serpent to trick Eve into eating the forbidden fruit. As a result, all women are condemned to painful childbirth, and the desire they have for their husband is laid on them as a punishment. Genesis 3.16 
Eve was not present when God told Adam not to eat the fruit, but Adam was present when Eve was deceived and he apparently did nothing to intervene. Not only did he let her eat the fruit, but he also joined in her sin. Then when God confronted him, Adam shifted the blame to Eve, saying, Genesis 3.12, The woman you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Eve, the most innocent character in the Bible, is deceived by the serpent, betrayed by Adam, and smited by God, all in quick succession. She faced the harshest punishment in all of the Bible, next to burning in hell, of course, for not being able to outwit the serpent. Fatherly? Forgiving? After God tricks the first humans into sin, we see the first murder in the Bible. Cain kills his brother, Abel, out of jealousy. Cain and Abel both offer their best to God, but God favors Abel's offerings. This angers Cain, and God warns him, saying, Genesis 4, 7, If you do what is right, will you not be rewarded? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Despite this warning, and literally being raised in the presence of God, Cain murders Abel. For the love of who? This pit demon. Then, as punishment, God tells him he will no longer have to farm, which is a crap job anyway since God made working the ground hard in his curse on Adam. And then Cain is marked for protection and allowed to live a long life, build a city, and father nations. All the best blessings God would visit on anyone in the Old Testament. Those were his punishments for murdering his own brother. Meanwhile, Eve, who was deceived by the serpent in her sin, faced severe punishment, pain in childbirth, and subservience to her husband's. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Genesis 3.16 Another goodie is the story of Noah, where this pit demon describes humans as wicked from childhood, kills all mankind, then his favored human curses an innocent child and his entire lineage to slavery for the actions of its father. Genesis 9, 24 and 25. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son Ham had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, Ham's son, the lowest of slaves, will he be to his brothers. Of course, God didn't curse Canaan. His favorite human, Noah, cursed the child. But it was God's power that backed up the curse. Then we move on to Abram and Sarai, where the hero of the story whores out his incestuous sister wife to the Pharaoh for coin, cattle, and slaves, and ends up giving the Pharaoh an STD. Genesis 12, 17, but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. But wait, she wasn't his sister. Oh yeah, she was. Genesis 20.12 Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother, and she became my wife. But when you read the scripture, you learn that she was also his niece. The God who wrote this book really seems to have a perversion for familial incest. A pit what? Lucky Lot. Now we get to Lot, Abram's nephew and fellow hero of the Bible, considered holy enough by God to send two messengers to save him from the destruction of Sodom. This holy man tried to throw his virgin daughters out to be raped by a horny horde of homosexual Hebrews who were wanting to sex up the messengers. Then he gets drunk and has sex with his own two daughters and has children by them, men children, who go on to father nations, all once again blessings of this god monster. But who's the villain in the story of Lot? Lot's wife, whose mortal sin was that she looked back against God's wishes. Forgiving? Loving? Perverted? Wicked? What kind of God monster is this? As I've mentioned, in the Old Testament, God punished in life. In the New Testament, he waits until the end. But the stakes are even higher. The God monster's punishment is now eternal, unending, and horrific, with Jesus presented as the only barrier. Accept him or burn forever. This is not salvation. It's extortion, an ultimatum, crafted by the same pit demon, trying to convince you it's the merciful creator of everything. What are your thoughts? Do you agree with me? Let me know in the comments below. I look forward to the ad hominem attacks from the Christians, so thank you for that too. Don't forget to subscribe so you'll get more of my live shows and my recorded content. Thank you very much and take care.